Hello, I'm uh, Chris Von Ruden. I'm uh, an assistant professor in the Jepson School of Leadership Studies. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to uh, the final event in Jepson School's 25th anniversary Jepson Leadership Forum Series, Vision and Division. Uh, Dr. Javier Hidalgo and I were uh, faculty co-organizers for the series. Uh, and want to thank you for taking part in these discussions over the past uh, few months. Um, we also want to thank Style Weekly, uh, which has been the exclusive media sponsor of this year's series. Uh, and now I'm pleased to introduce Patrick Hughes, who will uh, in turn introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, Patrick is a native of Bow, New Hampshire. Uh, he's a senior double majoring in leadership studies and philosophy, politics, economics, and law. He's a member of the Jepson Corps, uh, an emissary group of students who serve at the invitation of the Jepson's deans and based upon um, his academic performance and engagement in Jepson, the university, and the greater Richmond community. He's also a senator for the Richmond College Student Government Association, uh, and Patrick is a history buff who enjoys listening to podcasts. When he graduates in May, he's moving to Washington, D.C. to join a federal consulting firm. So please help me welcome Patrick to the podium. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's Jepson Leadership Forum speaker, Julia Galef. Uh, Ms. Galef is a San Francisco-based writer and public speaker with specialties in science, rationality, and design. Uh, she runs the Update Project, which is uh, a project whose mission is to help decision makers improve their judgment. Um, and related to that, she is currently writing a book about how uh, all of us can improve our judgment by reshaping unconscious motivations. Uh, Ms. Galef serves as the president um, for the Center for Applied Rationality, um, which she co-founded in 2012. Uh, she also serves on the board of directors of New York City Skeptics, and she co-hosts their official podcast, uh, Rationally Speaking, and co-writes the blog, Rationally Speaking, along with philosopher of science, science uh, Massimo Pigliucci. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, Ms. Galef received her Bachelor of Arts degree in statistics from Columbia University. Uh, so please, ladies and gentlemen, help me give a very warm welcome to Ms. Julia Galef. Thank you. It's great to be here. Appreciate that introduction. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about sports and the psychology of being a sports fan. This is an unusual topic, uh, especially for someone like me to be talking about, because uh, I'm famously clueless about sports. I was the kid who was always picked last for whatever we were playing in gym class, sometimes second to last. Those were really good days. Uh, but I you know, have not really kept up with professional sports. Um, to give you an illustrative example, I lived in Boston for two years after college, um, and one day I had a bad hair day, and so I reached for the one hat that I had way at the back of my closet um, that someone had given to me as a gift years ago. It was a Yankees cap. <laughs> and so I went around the streets of Boston wearing a Yankees cap and just completely baffled as to why everyone was glaring at me and hissing at me all day. I didn't even think to connect it to the cap. I was just like, everyone in the city hates me. It's just a really mean city. So that should give you a sense of how like, not plugged into sports I am. Um, but still, despite all that, I noticed something interesting about myself, which is that uh, at school, you know, high school and college, um, when our team, like our football team, won a game, I would say, you know, and I was like talking about it with someone, I'd say, oh yeah, we won last night. When the team had lost a game, I would say, oh yeah, they lost last night interesting. Um, I am not alone in that. Uh, there's one classic study from the 70s that found that college students were about twice as likely to use the pronoun we to talk about their team if it had won as opposed to if it had lost. Um, and people who are much more invested in sports than I am take it a lot further. They'll say like, we kicked their ass last night. They'll sort of gloat. 
Um, and so this is an interesting pronoun choice, right? It's, it's not like we, the fans, uh, were out on the field literally winning the game. We can't even claim to have had any real causal effect on the victory, um, as anyone except the most superstitious of the fans will acknowledge. And yet, we're not merely happy when the team that we support wins a game, we're proud. Um, it feels like, in a way, their victory is our victory. Their status boost is our status boost. This is a phenomenon that psychologists have called basking in reflected glory, or Berg, uh, for short, where affiliating yourself with winners makes you look and feel like a winner by association. Now, I'm not actually here tonight to talk about sports, but I started by talking about this phenomenon of investing your sense of identity in the teams that you support, because I think that this applies to all kinds of teams beyond the literal domain of you know, sports teams. Consider geographic teams, for instance. We feel proud when our country does something great, even if we had no causal role in it. You know, US is number one in Nobel Prize winners, woo! Or someone from our hometown um, or our school makes it big. We're like, oh, I like passed her in the hallway every day. Um, and it, it certainly also applies to political teams. When Obama won in 2012, liberal bloggers gloated over how much they were enjoying right-wing temper tantrums, um, and they gleefully shared images of Republicans grieving over their loss. There was a Tumblr that made the rounds called White People Mourning Romney. Uh, and then when Trump won in 2016, uh, conservatives did their own share of gloating, uh, advertising, for example, t-shirts that said, Trump won, suck it up, buttercup. Or mugs that said, enjoying my hot cup of liberal tears. Now, there's a common reaction that I get when I talk about political tribalism or political partisanship. And it goes something like this. Julia, of course I'm happy when the Democrats win or the Republicans lose, because I think the Republican policies are going to do immense harm to this country. Isn't it reasonable to be happy when they fail at that goal? That's not tribalism, that's just caring about outcomes. Um, and you can flip the version of that quote for the Republican version. Um, and my response is, yes, I agree that explains a large amount of partisanship. But I think that even making generous allowances for that point, we're still left with a lot of behavior that can only be explained by a my team rules and your team rules uh, spirit. Consider, for example, the phenomenon of liberals passing around studies which prove that conservatives have various unflattering traits. Like, uh, here's some real headlines I found recently. Science proves conservatives are dumb. Or, <laughs> I like this headline, brain study proves conservatives are big frady cats. <laughs> um, or on the flip side, conservatives uh, touting studies claiming that liberals are uglier than conservatives. Uh, or I've seen memes with photos of you know, overweight women at feminist marches captioned, this is why I'm not a Democrat. <laughs> it's really hard to explain such salvos as a desire to defeat bad policies. They're much more cleanly explicable as a desire to knock a rival team down a peg um, and to sort of boost your team's status uh, in, the, in response. And in fact, sometimes people even come right out and admit that they're motivated more by antagonism towards the other team than they are by any policy outcomes. For example, when Trump announced that he was going to pull the US out of the Paris Accords, a right-wing site gloated, it was an undeniably awesome week when measured by the only metric that truly matters, the amount of pain inflicted upon liberals. Now, because I've been giving examples of political partisanship, I want to make clear that the problem that I'm focused on is not people are mean to people from opposing teams and it's bad to be mean. That is certainly a problem in its own right, and it's one that needs to be tackled and that some people are working on, a lot of people are talking about, but that's not the problem that I'm pointing at here tonight. I'm pointing at something that is, I think, at least as important and maybe more insidious uh, of a problem with, with this kind of tribal way that we talk and think about politics, um, that our reliance on these teams for self-worth warps the way that we reason about important issues. It means that we're biased not just to prefer the policies of one team over another, but to literally see a different reality, different empirical facts, depending on our team. So this photo is from a study by a professor named Dan Kahan at Yale University. Um, the study is called They Saw a Protest. And what he did is he showed people footage of a large protest, people protesting outside of a building. 
And he told them, okay, this is evidence in a court case. Um, the court case is protesters are suing the police for uh, unfairly shutting down their protests. They're claiming this was like outside the police's right by law. Um, imagine your jurors in this case, watch the tape, and then answer a bunch of factual questions about what you see. So for example, the mock jurors had to answer questions like, were the protesters screaming in the face of pedestrians? Or did the protesters physically block entry to the building? Now the catch was that half of the mock jurors in the study were told that the footage depicted an anti-abortion protest outside of a family planning clinic. And the other half were told that it depicted an anti-war protest outside of an army recruiting clinic or a center. Um, the, the footage was, was actually neither of those things. It was just some unrelated protest that uh, Kahan and his team stitched together and they like hid the actual wording on the sign. So it could have been either of those things. Now, if you've been paying attention so far, you can probably guess the outcome of the study. Uh, the strongest predictor of whether the jurors believed that the protesters had broken the law was, do the protesters agree with my values or not? And the jurors whose values supported legal abortion felt that the anti-abortion protesters had broken the law um, and they didn't feel that the protesters against the army had crossed that line, uh, even though it was the exact same footage and vice versa for the people whose values supported the army. Um, and unfortunately, I've been talking about sports and politics, but those are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we seem hardwired to draw lines in the sand and then feel proud of which side of the line that we're standing on. So just to give you some non-political examples, or not literally political, uh, I live in Silicon Valley. Uh, I have observed many times that techies, people who work at tech companies, are, they feel a kinship with each other over shared values like idealism about progress, um, this kind of hacker style aesthetic of like tinkering, moving fast, breaking things, um, thumbing one's nose at stuffy conventions like wearing a suit to an interview. Um, and as a, these are like all things that tie the tribe together and make them feel proud of who they are. And as a result, fads in the tech world that are actually bad ideas take a long time to be recognized as such because they kind of comport with this identity. Like the open office plan, which is everyone working at desks out in the open, no walls, not even cubicles. Um, this was seen as a kind of a signal of anti-conformity for years at tech hubs like Facebook and Google until finally the evidence was just like overwhelmingly hard to ignore that the employees hated it and it destroyed productivity. And so now they're gradually moving away from it. It took a while. Different example, um, atheists band together officially over a shared rejection of religion. But atheist blogs and atheist conferences, many of which I've been to, also often mock religious people or talk about how atheists are happier or more, more altruistic or have better sex than religious people. Um, and it can be difficult to discuss or think about questions like, what benefits do people get out of religion? Um, is there something valuable we can learn from the social structures and practices and traditions of religion? Um, because those ideas are not those are not in support of the atheist team. Even people who claim to reject teams altogether and pride themselves on sort of contradicting the reigning worldview in their social circles often simply wind up on another team, the contrarian team, um, which manages to avoid adopting ideas just because they're popular, but only by rejecting ideas just because they're popular. <laughs> neither, neither strategy uh, is pointed at truth. Maybe you've heard, maybe some of you have heard of rule 34, which is, if it exists, there is porn of it. Well, consider this a corollary, call it rule 35. If it exists, there are ideologues of it. And this is even true of things that are so technical and esoteric that you can't imagine anyone having a passionate opinion about it at all. For example, which programming language is better, Python or Haskell? Which statistical methodology is more sensible, frequentism or Bayesianism? I've witnessed sniping and mockery over these divides, ranging from playful to not so playful. Uh, and for my part, I'm embedded in this social circle slash unofficial field of people interested in rationality, reasoning, decision making, how can we improve these things? Um, and in this community, there's a kind of informal division into two camps, one of which relies more on deductive logic and the other of which relies more on probabilistic reasoning. I'm simplifying here. And I'm kind of in the latter camp. And I confess I often find myself slightly irritated at those in the former camp. 
um, finding myself thinking, how can they think that way? How can that seem reasonable to them? And I notice their sort of weirdness as people more than I notice the weirdness of the people in my camp. And I don't, you know, when they propose an idea or an argument, I don't automatically treat it with the same charity that I treat ideas that come from people in my camp. And from the outside, I can see how ridiculous this must look. Uh, these people might be among the most similar people in the world to me. Uh, their misplaced trust in deductive logic notwithstanding. If you placed our views, like plotted our views on some ideological spectrum, the dots would be so close together you would probably just think they were the same dot unless you like zoomed in really close and squinted and you're like, oh yeah, I guess those are two different dots right next to each other. But as a political scientist once quipped, the politics of academia are so intense because the stakes are so low. <laughs> Which I like as a quote, but I would actually amend. I would say it's not, in this case, it's not so much about the stakes being low as it is about the distinctions being small. These, these disagreements, you know, over rationality or over statistics or over programming language, they're real disagreements and often the outcomes matter and it's worth trying to settle them and get the right answer. It's just that the more overlap you have with another team, the more their few differences from you really stand out. Um, and perhaps the more you feel betrayed by their recalcitrance, by their disagreement, coming as it does from the people you most expected to be on the same page as you. So now I wanna start getting practical and talk about, okay, if you agree this is a real and important phenomenon affecting the way that we think, the way that we reason collectively, how can we tell if we have identity invested in some issue? Now, sometimes you can tell just by paying attention to your emotional reactions. Like, do you feel irritated by arguments against your views? Um, do you feel a bit smug when you read an article that debunks something that you think is wrong? But a lot of the time I've found um, we're just not aware of those emotional reactions. They pass too quickly or too unconsciously for them to really be registered by us consciously. And when you ask yourself, do I hate the other side? Your brain quickly jumps in and answers, of course not, I don't hate people. So I think that introspection is not always the most reliable way to notice if you have identity invested in some issue. So instead, I like to use tests that are a little bit more objective, that are uh, observations of how you behave, not how you feel. So here are a couple of specific behavioral clues that might indicate if you have a lot of identity invested in something, in some belief. Do you talk about people who disagree with you with contempt? For example, do you use epithets like libtards, nutters, morons, wingnuts, monsters, or let's move on to verbs. Do you use neutral verbs when describing people who disagree with you, like they're making false claims? Or do you use contemptuous verbs, like they're spewing nonsense? Do you say, Bob said such and such, or Bob whined such and such? Or do you share articles or tweets that use language like that? And on the flip side, do you ever praise people you disagree with? Do you ever say, I think Bob is completely wrong about immigration, but he's a really stand-up guy. Or, I hate the politics of that book, but it's so beautifully written. You should be able to ask questions like this, even of people whose views you hate and even think are dangerous. Um, do they seem to care about other people, even if not as universally as you would like? Are they a person of their word? Uh, are they honest? Do they seem to genuinely believe in their principles, even if you think their principles are bad? Uh, as opposed to just being a troll. Are they willing to make sacrifices in the service of others? Are they intelligent? Are they hardworking? Are they brave? All of these traits are roughly independent of ideology. Um, you should be able to spot them and give credit where credit's due, regardless of whether you find someone's views wrong, um, even dangerously wrong. If you find it hard to see any good in someone uh, who disagrees with you on a certain topic, I think that's a strong sign that the topic has become identity invested. Here's some examples that I like of praise from someone for people uh, who he strongly disagrees with. So Obama is no great fan of the Koch brothers. They've given, I think, hundreds of millions of dollars to his political rivals to help defeat him. Um, and their views on policy are very different from his. But in a speech to the NAACP several years ago, he gave them credit for their work on prison sentencing reform, which is a thing he does agree with them on. 
Um, I think his audience either like booed or like scoffed or expressed their incredulity in some way. And Obama responded, no, you've got to give them credit. You've got to call it like you see it. He's also given sincere praise to Reagan uh, when he was talking about our relations with Iran a few years ago. He said, you know, I have a lot of differences with Ronald Reagan, but where I completely admire him was his recognition that if you were able to verify an agreement that you would negotiate with the evil empire, the USSR, that was hell-bent on our destruction and was a far greater existential threat to us than Iran will ever be, then it would be worth doing. Frustratingly, uh, the news outlets that reported this quote from Obama uh, were unable to interpret it through anything other than a partisan lens. So, for example, one journalist described this quote saying, in defense of the Iran deal, President Obama has suddenly become a partisan of Ronald Reagan. And another one used the headline, Obama taunts GOP on Iran by comparing himself to Reagan. <laughs> so that's frustrating. Um, Reagan, in turn, was great at recognizing the admirable traits in people on opposite sides of the political spectrum from him, like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who Reagan thought had made a big mistake in growing the size of the federal government decades ago. But he had great admiration for FDR's leadership. Um, and he, he talks in his autobiography, he talks about the fireside chats that FDR conducted when Reagan was just a child. He said, his strong, gentle, confident voice resonated across the nation with an eloquence that brought comfort and resilience to a nation caught up in a storm and reassured us that we could lick any problem. I will never forget him for that. Or consider Barry Goldwater. During his lifetime, he was known as Mr. Conservative. He was often called a radical or an extremist. He was fervently anti-communist, believed in small government and states' rights, and helped grow the modern conservative party. Yet Goldwater, too, would defend people that he felt deserved defending, even if he strongly disagreed with them on many issues. So when Bill Clinton was president and he was coming under attack for the Whitewater scandal, uh, Goldwater held a press conference to tell his fellow Republicans to lay off Clinton. His point was basically he didn't think the evidence was very strong against Clinton, he said, quote, I haven't heard anything yet that says this is all out of a big deal. And he thought the president should be left alone to be president, even if his politics were different. All right, so how do we start to divest our identity from our beliefs? It's the opposite of having identity invested. How do you divest? Um, and by this, I don't mean that we should stop supporting the political parties that we think are doing good, or that we should stop fighting for causes that we care about. I mean that we should become less reflectively supportive, or reflexively supportive of those issues, less defensive when they're criticized, more able to see nuance or flaws in the current thinking of the group or the movement. So one of the most important pieces of advice, advice that I can give is just to be wary of the labels that you use to define yourself um, and how they make you feel committed to defending that group. For my part, I'm involved in a movement called Effective Altruism. It's about helping the world as effectively as possible using reason and evidence. Um, and one thing that I've noticed in conversation is that when I tell someone I'm an effective altruist, I end up feeling like I have to defend EA on, on anything that they throw at me. So for example, they might say, you know, I've heard some effective altruists say that you can't justify spending any money on yourself if there are people dying elsewhere in the world who you could be saving with your money. That's crazy. Uh, you're an EA, why do you guys think that? And I sort of reflexively launch into a defense of the position, even though I don't share it. Uh, but I'm an EA, so I have to represent EA. But if instead I approach the conversation thinking or, or explicitly saying, like, I'm involved with the EA movement, um, or something else that doesn't feel like I'm staking my identity on the movement, my reaction is different. Um, it's easier for me to just say, oh, I don't agree with that. I'll tell you what I think. When I introspect about this phenomenon, I think that in declaring myself to be an EA, I feel on some level like I'm implying that I share the views of other effective altruists, and so then I feel pressured to defend those opinions or risk looking inconsistent with what I just said I am. Um, that's unconscious, but that's, that's sort of what it feels like. Uh, another piece of evidence I think about the power of labels to affect how people see you and what you feel you've sort of implicitly promised about yourself is that our brains seem to be wired to make very different inferences about someone uh, on the basis of these subtle distinctions in language, even just using an adjective versus a noun. Uh, he is a liberal, 
versus, sorry, he is liberal versus he is a-liberal. He is intellectual versus he is an intellectual. He is sexist versus he is asexist. Those are almost identical phrasings, but people interpret the noun as a much stronger statement about that person, much more central to them, to their, their character and who they are and what they believe, much more um, unchanging and stable over time. And you can even see this in children. If you tell children, Rose eats carrots whenever she can, versus Rose is a carrot eater, they will make very different assumptions about Rose in those two cases. Um, if Rose is classified as a carrot eater, children will say, yes, Rose is going to continue to eat carrots when she's all grown up. Rose would eat carrots even if no one else in her family did. As, and they don't make those predictions if the person just says, like, Rose eats carrots whenever she can. Um, if Rose is a carrot eater, that means her carrot eating is a deep property of her, something that is stable and unchanging over time. So when you talk about liberals and conservatives, it sounds like you're positing two fundamentally different types of person. Uh, and, and of course they are different in many ways on average. The words are not meaningless, but using the nouns, using the labels, makes the differences seem bigger and deeper and more fundamental. Now of course, labels are useful and it can be hard to communicate without them. Um, if someone asks, are you an American? Uh, it's a little weird and clunky to say, Yes, I have American citizenship. Um, so I still use labels. Uh, I just try to keep in mind that they don't define me and that I don't have to defend the group if I don't agree with them. So here's just an example to illustrate what it can be like to hold your identity lightly. This is from a friend of mine. He says, a couple years ago, I identified as a feminist. When I heard someone argue against feminist views, I felt like my tribe was under attack. Sometimes I would get defensive and even when I managed to stay reasonable, doing so was an unpleasant task that required effort. Today, I'm a person who agrees with most ideas that are part of the feminist consensus. This feels very, very different from the inside. I have an easier time approaching these debates on their merits, so I've changed my mind on a small number of issues. More importantly, I have a much, much easier time ignoring unproductive debates on the subject, i.e. I've squashed the someone is wrong on the internet urge in this particular context. But if you ask me whether I'm a feminist, I'll probably say yes, because that communicates the thing you want to know. Aside from being careful with how you self-identify and what that commits you to, there's a technique that I find really effective in divesting your identity from your beliefs. It's called the ideological Turing test. In order to explain it, I'll first tell you what the original Turing test is. It was proposed in 1950 by Alan Turing, father of computing. Um, as a way to determine whether a piece of software, an artificial intelligence, was as intelligent as a human. Um, it was too difficult to define intelligence, he said, so here's an easier way to decide. Can it successfully pass as a human? So the way the Turing test works is that people chat you know, online with someone who might either be a fellow human or an AI, like a chatbot. Uh, and they ask it questions like, so where do you go to school? Uh, you know, what's your name, et cetera. And they try to guess which it is, human or AI. And if one of the AIs is frequently judged to be human, it is considered to have passed the Turing test. Now, there are a lot of problems with the Turing test. It can be gamed, it's, people uh, have objections with that definition of intelligence, that's fine. I just, I'm explaining it because the ideological Turing test is inspired by that. The ideological Turing test was originally proposed by the economist Brian Kaplan, and it's asking the question, how can you tell if you really understand the other side's position, their thinking? And the answer is, if you can pass for someone with that position. So if you're a Democrat, can you explain the case against Hillary well enough that Republicans would nod and say, yep, you're one of us? If you're an atheist, can you explain the case for Christianity convincingly enough that Christians would think, I bet I know which church he goes to? That's the original version of the ITT. Um, it's not a perfect test in practice because it, it can be gamed. Um, for example, if someone knows enough of the right jargon or buzzwords, they can often pull off a con convincing impression of someone on the other side, even if they really don't know much about the logic behind the beliefs. So for example, I've seen Christians uh, perform pretty well on the ITT by bringing up a bunch of cultural touchstones in the atheist world like Star Trek and Cosmos and this rationalist fan fiction called Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, and people will be like, oh yeah, that's an atheist. <laughs> so it's not perfect. Um, but the version that I like better, which is harder to game, is can you explain someone's view, like why they hold that view, in a way that they would endorse? 
that they would say, yes, that is what I believe. You have said it well. Um, and often you learn that you were un unknowingly caricaturing the other side's views. So the earliest example of the ideological Turing test that I found in the literature, um, although it wasn't called that, was conducted by some researchers during the Vietnam War. Uh, they asked college students, first, do you consider yourself a hawk or a dove? Are you pro-Vietnam War or anti-Vietnam War? And then they asked all the participants to write out uh, four statements that they expected a typical hawk at their college would agree with, and four statements that they expected a typical dove at their school would agree with. And then everyone read, you know, the hawks all read the statements that people thought hawks would agree with, and the doves read the statements that people thought doves would agree with, and they checked, like, do I agree with this, yes or no? Um, and the result was that on average, people thought the other side was much more extreme than they actually were. So doves, for example, expected hawks to agree with statements like, any and all means are justified in blocking the expansion of communism in Vietnam. But in practice, a lot of hawks rejected that as too extreme. Um, and hawks expected doves to agree with statements like, our involvement in Vietnam is the reflection of a power-mad obsession on the part of a few individuals in government and is totally without justification. But in practice, many of the doves rejected statements like that as too extreme. More recently, uh, researchers on moral psychology have done something similar in testing people's ability to predict what moral views liberals and conservatives would agree with. And again, both sides mispredicted the other. Actually, liberals were the most inaccurate. Um, liberals would predict that conservatives would not agree with statements like, one of the worst things a person could do is hurt a defenseless animal, or justice is the most important requirement in the society. And actually, conservatives often agreed with those statements. So doing the ITT is helpful uh, directly in giving you a better understanding of what the other side actually believes. But I think that even attempting the ideological Turing test, even before you check your answers with someone, or if you can't check your answers with someone on that side, I think it really reduces feelings of team identity, of tribalism, because it forces you to try to imagine how the view that you hate and disagree with could seem reasonable to someone, even if it's wrong. And also the ITT serves as a kind of meta test for you, um, because a lot of people feel unwilling to even attempt the ideological Turing test. Um, it feels like even trying to uh, role play as someone who agrees with that view, or even trying to you know, model what the other, that other side believes feels bad or immoral, um, like saying something profane. And I think that's a strong sign that your identity is invested in your views on that issue as well. I'd like to give you a word of caution. Um, don't let yourself use your knowledge of this phenomenon uh, as an excuse to dismiss people. Because you can always come up with an identity-based story if you try. For example, if you're frustrated with people who don't accept that global warming is real, you can always accuse them of having identity invested in being pro-capitalism, and capitalism would be undermined by climate change regulations, and that's why they disagree. Or conversely, if you're looking for a reason to dismiss people who argue that global warming is real, uh, you can always accuse environmentalists of being part of a religion of environmentalism uh, that its, its adherents derive pride from and aren't allowed to question. And once you start allowing yourself to say, I don't have to listen to your argument because you're probably just motivated by identity, you've just handed yourself an all-purpose get out of listening tool uh, to vanish any argument that you dislike. And it's a conversation ender too. The other person can't really defend themselves from the charge of unconscious motivation, so it just freezes a discussion in mid-stride. For example, I have a friend who sometimes argues that America's foreign policy is immoral. I agree with a lot of what she says, I push back on other parts, and when I do push back, her response is often, well, but of course you would disagree, because you're an American, and you're motivated to not want to believe that the country you grew up in can do bad things. And I can say honestly that I don't feel like that's what's motivating my response, but I can't prove it, and so we have nowhere to go from there. So in my opinion, the best way to react to like, learning about this, the, the way that the human brain reasons and how, how big of a role team psychology and tribalism and, and like, defending your identity plays in our reasoning is just to turn its lens on yourself and not on other specific people. Um, use it to ask yourself questions like, 
what teams or tribes have I affiliated myself with? Uh, how might that be affecting my decision making? In conclusion, this is a hard problem, you guys. People sometimes ask me, uh, Julia, how can we get everyone in America to be rational and reasonable and objective? And I'm like, first of all, lower your expectations. That is not a realistic goal to set. There are a lot of forces working against us here. Um, there's evolution and you know, the way that our brains evolved to see in-groups and out-groups and to be good at using our views to you know, signal our allegiance to one group instead of another or to like, raise the status of one group over another. And there are societal dynamics too that make this problem really hard. You know, if even 1% of a side is really loud and unreasonable, that gets a ton of attention. And so you know, it makes that whole side look loud and unreasonable. And it makes it really tempting for people to respond in kind. And so the cycle continues. Um, so there's a huge coordination problem as well, not just a problem with you know, the way individual brains react to charged topics. But it's not an impossible problem to make progress on. And one thing that I find encouraging is that even if only a small subset of the population is really reasonable, that small subset can make a big difference if they have disproportionate influence on society. So, you know, 10,000 people is not a lot compared to 200 million American adults, but if those 10,000 people are disproportionately influential in public discourse or policy making or allocating funding or just like really effective activists, um, that can have an outsized impact. So I just need all of you to do two things. First, get really good at divesting your identity from your beliefs and not letting team psychology and tribalism distract you from viewing the world and viewing important issues as accurately and honestly as you can. And second, accumulate a ton of power and influence in society. <laughs> and then we might have a shot. Thank you. And I believe we have some time for questions. So if you want to line up at either of those mics, I'll uh, take you in the order you get here. That was wonderful. Thank, thank, you. thank you for leaving us with some hope. When I was uh, in very early on in my um, schooling, the teacher would frequently uh, ask us, are you a, an A or a B? Yeah. And whatever you said you were, she'd make you write the argument for the other side. That didn't go where I thought that was. I going. hated that. <laughs> and she would say, well, this isn't convincing. Get, give me some really strong power. That's so interesting. And I'm wondering if you think this exercise could encourage very young people to develop less of the problem that, we are, that you're discussing here tonight. It sounds pretty plausible to me. I, I actually don't know anyone who's tested this with, uh, with young children. Um, I, I've seen adults, you know, do this on the internet sort of unofficially for, you know, their own edification, but uh, it seems to me like the kind of thing children could probably do, at least once they're old enough to have, you know, thought about the issues to some extent and not just like, I'm a Democrat because my parents are Democrats. I think, you know, I, I know a lot of kids who are like, I'm a Democrat. I said that when I was, you know, seven. If you'd ask me, like, what do the Democrats think and, like, why do you disagree with the Republicans, I would have been like, because Bush is evil, that's all I got, so, yeah. But I love the idea. Maybe some teachers here wanna take that and run with it. Hi, hey. I'm a teacher. Yay. <laughs> um, yeah, I teach high school and we just have been spending a unit on the Cold War. So we did this for nuclear armament. Um, is, are nuclear weapons, do they have a role in society? Are they a good thing? Do we need to continue? 
uh, having them or not. And um, it was really divisive at first. And then when we switched sides, everyone started like laughing and giggling and actually listening and like having fun with each other. So it like made the stress of, oh my gosh, I have to make this really big, scary decision. And I'm really angry at that side. And people were able to open up and listen. So it does work, you know. That's really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I would love if you could email me uh, so I can get more information on what you did because I know a lot of teachers who want to try things like this so they could learn from that. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Julia Galef. My email address is juliagaleff at gmail.com. So anyone, feel free to email me. Hey. Hi, Julia. <laughs> uh, so I, I kind of want to consider how you, how you handle a challenge. So uh, here's the idea. Sometimes we need to mobilize our kind of partisan loyalties to do the best we can. And so sometimes we, we ourselves will do worse at arriving at the truth if we're very partisan. But if we're really motivated by our side, maybe we'll somehow collectively arrive at better positions overall because we're really motivated to fight for our side. So I'm curious what you, what you think about that. So I don't find it convincing that a group could arrive at more accurate positions um, if everyone is entrenched. Mm -hmm. uh, I, either theoretically or in practice, I haven't, I've seen only the opposite. Um, what I do find convincing is kind of a slight variant of that argument that, uh, and this isn't actually an objection that I've gotten as well, um, that like, look, you have to like get stuff done in the world and like people are very motivated by like fighting for their team and like beating the other team. And you know, you might just have to choose between like being able to think clearly, as clearly as possible about the issues and like making change happen in the world. Um, I think there's something to that, but I've seen so many examples of identity making people less effective at the cause that they actually care about. Um, so actually, for example, I was just talking to a, a, an animal welfare activist, um, and he was talking about how, like, first of all, like his identity investment in animal welfare for a long time made it really hard for him to like engage with people and change people's minds because he was just like was so like angry at them for not agreeing with him, um, and it, it was like hard for him to even model like why don't these people already agree with me? So it made him less effective in that way. Um, his at the organization that he was working with, he felt that they got less effective because they uh, they would kind of like get entrenched in these battles with like you know a particular um, uh, a particular like restaurant chain or grocery store or something, and like it would not either like originally or at some point it would not actually turn out to be the best use of their resources. Um, you know, it would be like very small in in magnitude, like the amount of animals who could be affected would be very small compared to like how they could, the amount of change they could cause if they put the resources elsewhere, but they were like, we can't let them win. Um, and you know, we've like, we've like rallied the troops to fight this fight. Uh, and then even within the organization, this is like now three levels of identity in, even within the organization, there were like teams, kind of like the teams I was describing of like the frequentists and the Bayesians or the probabilistic people, the logic people. Um, there were teams who everyone cared about animal welfare, but like, you know, some people thought, you know, we should be trying to like, like reduce meat consumption. Other people thought like, no, that's gonna like, like make it permissible to eat even any meat and we can't do that. And, and they just got into like these horribly unproductive fights with each other uh, that just like reduce the overall movement's effectiveness by a lot. Um, so I think like, ideally, I think the best thing to do if you wanna like make change happen in the world but not get entrenched in like ineffective positions and strategies is to have, like, be invested in, like, the fundamental value, the reason that you got involved in the cause in the first place. Like, be invested in, like, saving lives or be invested in, like, reducing animal suffering. Um, and then, you know, the way you feel about your particular cause or movement or organization should be, like, it's like a partnership or an alliance. And, like, I want to help you succeed to the extent that you're, like, helping the cause that, the, like, the actual thing that I value. And if you're you know, not doing that, I want to notice so that I don't like help this thing that's not actually helping the value that I care about. Does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah, I was just kind of curious whether an adversarial model sometimes makes sense, right? Like, you know, like a courtroom, right? So. I mean, if someone outside the group who doesn't have a lot of identity invested in any of the positions is listening to the people argue, 
and is like not overly swayed by who yells the loudest or who is the tallest or other things that aren't correlated with truth, then that could work. I and mean, that's how the court system is set up. Um, but like if you're in the movement, I don't know if it would help you. I'm just speculating. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hi, two questions. Yeah. Um, if we have a deep-seated instinct to bond with other people with a common identity, mm -hmm. maybe that's something we shouldn't try to give up. I mean, we can think about the Marines who have an identity and that cohesiveness leads to survival and success at some deep, deep level. So I'm, I'm wondering about uh, why we have this affinity to form affiliations and create identities mm -hmm. and whether it's something that's necessary for survival. Two, to what extent does ego get wrapped up in all of this? And to follow your plan, should we become more Buddhist? <laughs> so many great questions there. Uh, so the, uh, the, the first thing you asked about, like maybe this is actually good for our survival and that's why it evolved. Is my mic still on? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I think it was uh, like, like bonding with uh, like our in-group did in fact, it, that's like an effective way to defeat the out-group. So if your like tribe um, you know, is really bonded together, just like operates in sync, doesn't like fight with each other, that's like a great way to, to defeat the enemy. Um, and I, I think, you know, this evolutionary psychology, it's like somewhat speculative, but I, I think it's like pretty plausible that that's why this urge to like have in-groups and out-groups and fight the out-groups evolved. Um, but, and, and, and in like limited situations, like if you're fighting a war uh, and you're like in the Marines and you're not like trying to figure out issues together, you're just like really have to win, you know, maybe this, the like, subsume your identity to the group is just like the most effective thing to do. But I, I think that our modern, the modern context that we're in now um, is pretty different from the environment in which these tendencies in our brains evolved. Um, you know, it's advantageous maybe locally for like the specific tribe or type of people to have this instinct. But if everyone's doing that, then the whole world's fighting with everyone else. And so, you know, if, if we care about sort of the world being better off, we might have to reduce our, you know, the thing that makes our particular in-group better off. Um, also, the fights we're fighting are different now than the fights, like, uh, unless you're literally in the army, uh, a lot of our fights are like over ideas and arguments and empirical questions that we actually have to figure out. And it, you know, the urge that, the identity urges that make you really effective at like bonding together and fighting are very different from the ones that make you effective at like figuring out which policy is actually going to work um, or like where the money should go. So I just think the types of questions we're trying to answer and like what we want to think of as our in-group as humans in the modern world are very different now than they used to be. But that still in limited contexts, this kind of identity investment could be the thing. Um, and then your second question was about ego and Buddhism. And um, yes, yeah, so there's, I've been, I've been kind of, playing fast and loose with the words identity and tribalism and teams uh, and the actual like structure of, of these concepts is, is pretty messy and they're all related to each other. Um, but one way to break it down would be personal versus social identity. So your personal identity is like the things about yourself as a person that you pride yourself on um, seem important to who you are. You know, maybe, and they'll vary from person to person. Like maybe I have a lot of identity invested in being um, you know, passionate and you like don't have identity invested in that or, or like would think it was bad or, or not you. Um, most people have some identity invested in like being seen as competent uh, or you know, reasonable or smart or something like that um, or being good at things. Uh, so that's, that's like personal identity. Social identity is like where do I fit into the world? Where, how do I relate to the other groups of, of people in the world? Um, and so I, I've, been, I've been kind of mostly focusing on social identity in, in this talk. Um, it relates to personal identity in that like, you know, the things that you pride yourself on, the values you try to live up to as a person will depend in part on which groups you're affiliated with. Like, if you're an activist, maybe your personal identity will be more about being like virtuous or passionate. Um, but if you're like a scientist, maybe your personal identity will be more about like being a careful thinker or something like that. So they're, they're related. Um, uh, Buddhism, Buddhism is great 
for the for these purposes in in some ways, um, in that it like reduces your feeling of attachment to your ego, um, reduces your sort of feeling of investment in any particular thing being true. Um, I'm just talking sort of colloquially of what Buddhism is like known to be good for. I'm not personally, I don't personally have experience with Buddhism. Um, the thing that I think Buddhism might not be as good for is the like actually wanting to change the world. Um, like it might be really good at like accepting that reality is the way it is. Maybe it isn't the way you wanted it to be initially. Um, and that's a valuable thing to be able to do, but you still want to take the next step and be like, okay, I've accepted how things currently are. Let's make them better. So from my cursory understanding of Buddhism, it's not, it's like not optimized for that. Yeah. Hi. Hey. My name is also Julia. Oh. Um, so I think it's um, really important for humans to be like members of groups and like get that resulting acceptance. Like that's really important for happiness. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what signals group membership is like how firmly you believe in your group's ideals. Yeah. So um, do you think this process like of sort of like separating yourself from like that identity has the potential to like be harmful and that it could marginalize you or like isolate you from your group? <sighs> yeah, I mean, so ideally, you know, this is another way in which the modern world is different from the ancestral environment. We have some freedom now to choose which groups we want to be a part of. Um, not complete freedom, like we can't choose our families, um, for one thing. Uh, but, you know, some groups, like, in some groups it's more important to, like, toe the party line or to, like, share their beliefs than in other groups. Um, and some groups are, like, much more fine with you, you know, not like having disagreements or like not caring as much about the things that they care about than other groups. And so um, this is sort of a, this is like a big part of what I think of, of I, like the most effective way to like become a better, clearer thinker is to just put yourself in social environments where you aren't like strongly disincentivized from doing that. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you, yeah, I, I'm not going to say there's no trade-off at all. Like, if, if you really want to be part of and feel close to and be accepted by a group whose beliefs are very important to them and, like, care that you agree, then that's a trade-off. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm part of this effort to try to um, speak to the other side or see some value in being a member of a, a tribe. There is an argument uh, from people who are ideological that, one of the things that's missing now is that we don't have these rock solid beliefs and so we've become wishy-washy mm -hmm. and that's the, you know an argument that that's what's happening in society we've lost the you know the, the core family and things are falling apart and there's no structure but i'm thinking of maybe small groups who really believe strongly it's not necessarily a, an issue where they're going to change the world but they they really think it's very important to believe what they believe, whether you do or not. And one of the groups that comes to mind, I'm not a member of this, but I have a daughter who is, is veganism. Mm -hmm. Kind of a fringe group still, getting yeah. a little more known, but very passionate and very committed to their core beliefs, whether or not it changes things. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a whole spectrum of people who are you know, rigid veganists and then some who are more moderate. But isn't there a role for the rigid person, for the person who's willing to die for their beliefs, who's willing to really stick with it, whether or not it's going to change the world today, tomorrow, but maybe 100 or 200 years from now? Well, I, I was sort of trying in one of my earlier answers, I think to Javier, um, to make a distinction between uh, being invested in and, and passionate about a value. Um, like reducing animal suffering or, or uh, you know, improving animal welfare versus being really invested and passionate about the particular group or the particular movement as it currently exists. Um, I don't see any, uh, any contradiction between like, being willing to you know, criticize or dissent from the current group of vegans and being willing to die for your cause if that seems effective. I don't. I suspect in many cases it wouldn't be the most effective thing to do as a vegan, but if it was, I could imagine someone you know, who is like 
a really like clear, sharp, independent thinker being like, yep, I'm gonna die for my cause. Um, and that, those two seem compatible to me. Yeah. Hello, I have enjoyed your presentation as I'm sure we all have. I would, I would just like to make a comment and then a postscript. But I'd like to do the postscript first and that is, in terms of uh, Mahayana Buddhism versus Theravada Buddhism, I think Theravada is You're more of the... explain that because I don't know the difference. Well, Theravada would be Please more leave. to a sense of uh, inner serenity and peace and harmony. And Mahayana would be more social oriented and engaged in social action and, and progress and so on. That's the postscript. But as I say, I, I really enjoyed your presentation and I'd like to just try to add just something minor and that would be a cognitive structure. Uh, I think it's championed by John Dewey in a book entitled How We Think. And he set out three principles, basically impartiality, thorough critical analysis, and experimentation. And I'd just like to apply those in a battle that I think we're all engaged in and all have an identity in, and that would be the battle of the sexes. And in terms of impartiality... A big suspense break there. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a teacher, so I, it takes me time to think of something. I would say, in terms of impartiality, we're all engaged in either married living together, married not living together, not married living together, or not married not living together. Covered the space there. Yeah. And because I like to have five, I always throw in one, and jail. I just, what the hell? <laughs> and, and then to set that into a cognitive structure for thorough and critical analysis, we go, uh, let's anticipate uh, one year from now, five years from now, and 10 years from now as a uh, across the horizontal bar and then on the vertical bar we can go uh, education occupation transportation physical health mental health uh, children in-law relationships etc just to let you know we we're almost out of time so yeah and this is the end oh, oh, oh. i did the postscript first so i got that out of the way and and then you uh, fill in the blanks and uh, then you have something to think about and you have so many different and varied points because you can do that for each of your alternatives. Married, living together, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, then, then you have something to talk about rather than strictly arguing and repeating your standard theme to your ideology. So that would be... I, I agree these kind of like structures, like being very systematic in the way you're breaking down the questions can help. It's just like a different mode of, of thinking and talking when you're like trying to analyze something together than if you're arguing about something. So, like, I think a lot of different structures can work as long as it, like, gets you out of the antagonistic mode and into the, like, figure this out mode. Are we out of time? All right. All right. Thank you, guys. This is great.